Welcome to Philosophical Reactions, where we do the vital work of reviewing the earliest issues of the world's oldest scientific journal. This month we'll be looking at the return of the monstrous calf, silkworms, mercury mining, and microscopy. The day is Monday, April 3rd, 1665. You're in a London coffee shop. Let's go. First up, we have a pair of articles. This is a slightly snippy letter from Giovanni Domenico Cassini, an astronomer and namesake of the Cassini probe sent to Saturn some 300 years later. He is responding to a letter in issue 1 from Adrien Azou and his predictions for the path of a new comet. I have, with the same method, whereby I find the motion of this comet, easily found the principle of that author's ephemerides, which he then thought not fit to declare. He goes on to say that it's going around the great dog, in a circle so large that it looks like a straight line. This is immediately followed by a response. Azu hits back, asserting that no, he actually did the geometry based on observations long before it got anywhere close to the great dog. After some speculations about comets to need to enter our system through the sign of Libra, he ends by getting a bit snippy himself. He warns that the apparent brightness of the common might have seemed to increase when he said it should be decreasing, but that was just because of it passing in front of some dim stars that a less careful observer might have missed. If Signor Cassini hath observed it on those days that I have, he will be glad to find the conformity of our observations. Fans of Monstrous Calf will be glad to know its story isn't over yet. More details have been sent to Mr. Boyle. The skin of the beast wasn't stony, just thick and its feet were like those of a dog. The stone with which it was found is egg-shaped, and a chunk is being sent by way of Oxford. This is a long and fairly interesting description of a mercury mine in Friuli. This is now in Slovenia, but in 1665 had long been a Venetian territory. The valley of the mine is described as being very green and lush, which they there there attribute to the moistness of the mercury. How truly I dispute not. The mine is dedicated to St. Barbara, patron saint of miners, military engineers, artillerymen, and anyone else who might die a sudden and explosive death. Powder magazines used to be called Santa Barbara's because of this, and Santa Barbara, California was named that after an explorer survived a violent storm offshore there on the eve of her saint's day. Thanks, Wikipedia! The mine is described as being 125 paces deep with the note that their paces are more than five of our feet. If you think the confusion over multiple unit systems is bad now, just imagine trying to get anything done when every polity had their own system of units. And even those kept changing over time, as the local nobles in charge of them kept shifting the definitions to extract more in rent. If you've ever wondered why setting up the metric system was part of the French Revolution, that is why. Metrology, it's more important than you think. The vein of mercury the mine is digging out sounds incredibly rich, with native mercury visible as globules within the looser soil, as well as what sounds like cinnabar or some other high-quality ore. After being hauled out of the mine, the mercury is extracted by means of washing through wire screens of different sizes. This is shown in the first Philosophical Transactions diagram. Too bad for anyone downstream of this operation, of course. The output from this is then smelted in retorts, creating ordinary mercury but it was the native mercury which was found in its pure metallic form that they were most excited about. The article calls it virgin mercury, and apparently is worth a lot more, being considered higher quality. We're still in the age of hermetic alchemy, remember, and mercury, along with sulfur and salt, was considered to be one of the primary building blocks of the universe by many. The laborers are paid six or seven pence a day, and all of them in time, some later, some sooner, become paralytic and die hectic. The author describes meeting a man who had been working there only six months, who was so poisoned with mercury that he could tarnish brass by putting it in his mouth. He was so paralytic that he could not with both hands carry a glass half full of wine to his mouth without spilling it, though he loved it too well to throw it away. The article ends with a description of a water-powered blower system in Tivoli, near Rome. Instead of using water to turn a wheel to pump bellows, a stream of water flows over one end of a pipe, as shown in the second diagram. This looks like a basic Venturi effect, except the air should be going into the pipe, not coming out of it. 
I suspect the author just didn't listen to the explanation very closely, and assumed it worked like normal bellows. The fire wouldn't care which way the air is going, a draft is a draft, but it does seem like the pipe would quickly get clogged with ash this way. That's probably why it is such a novel approach. It wasn't even mentioned in Deiri Metallica that I could find, and an idea had to be pretty weird for Agricola not to mention it. Maybe it was a new invention, but maybe it just didn't work very well in practice. It must have needed quite a bit of quickly flowing water, which could have been more profitably put to work turning machinery. This is an account from a gentleman who is interested in sericulture in Virginia. In the process, he has discovered some things that might be of interest. You can feed wilted leaves to silkworms if you soak them in water first. Rank smells like tobacco do not bother silkworms. Nor does thunder. Nor does prickly holly. He hopes to show that two crops of silk might be made in a single summer, but my servants have been remiss in what was ordered. I must crave your patience till next year. This is a glowing and lengthy review of Robert Hooke's Micrographia. Hooke was well known within the society as he was the curator of experiments, responsible for arranging curious demonstrations at their meetings. Unlike many members, he was not a gentleman with an independent income. He had to work for his living, which made him in the eyes of some unfit to pursue science. How could someone be properly objective if they were constantly worried about money? This concern would go away with the emergence of professional scientists over the next few hundred years, but Hooke was one of the first. Filled with gorgeous, otherworldly illustrations, Micrographia was the surprise popular science bestseller of the age. And while fantastical, Hooke's illustrations mostly stand up very well compared with modern imaging. The patience needed to draw them must have been intense. Using a microscope today isn't easy, and the primitive versions he would have been using were almost impossible. Have you ever wondered why, if microscopes could do this in the late 17th century, the image of a scientist using a microscope feels much more 19th century? Because that's when more modern microscope designs were developed. Before that, you basically had to be an obsessive genius like Robert Hooke to get much out of them. According to the review, Hooke is a good Baconian who knows what advantages experimental and mechanical knowledge hath over the philosophy of discourse and disputation, and making it, upon that account, his constant business to bring into that vast treasury what portion he can. However, a closer look at the book brings this somewhat into question. There seems to be a tendency for books from this age to be particularly discursive, as if the authors, given the opportunity to publish a book, wanted to cram in as many thoughts as possible. Hobbes's Leviathan is like that. Everyone remembers the political philosophy in the first half, and forgets the lengthy biblical exegesis attacking the Catholic Church in the second half. Hooke's Micrographia is no different. It is filled with glorious illustrations of the microscopic world, but it gives almost as much space to a mechanical philosophy so complex it rivals Descartes. Based on the concepts of congruity and incongruity, it attempts to explain everything from capillary effects to gravity. This was quite controversial within the society, though the review does not hint at that. While his ideas were based somewhat on experimental results, Hooke seemed to be getting dangerously close to the kind of ivory tower speculations which the entire Baconian experiment was supposed to be against. The fact that this would only be the second book the society had published, using the rare power of their printing license, only raised the stakes higher. When permission was finally granted, it was with the stricture to make clear that the society was not endorsing his hypotheses. The review first lists some of the things Hooke has microscoped. Some of these are notable for the beauty of their illustrations, others for being fundamental discoveries in their own right, such as that of cells. Hooke saw these in samples of cork, and was the one to name them cells, as they reminded him of the small rooms monks live in. Not letting himself be limited by the title, Hooke also included telescopic observations, including a study of the moon's surface. There were also descriptions of several inventions of his. These included a barometer, a hygrometer, a thermometer, and a new engine for grinding optic glasses. This last one will be the subject of a future article, when our friend in Paris, Adrien Azou, takes offense as Hook had never actually made such a thing. The review ends with a hope that is straight out of the New Atlantis. Lastly, this author despairs not that there may be found many mechanical inventions to improve our senses of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, as well as we have improved that of seeing by optic glasses. Hook actually made some specific suggestions along these lines in the preface to Micrographia.
Since the sense of smelling seems to be made by the swift passage of the air, impregnated with the steams and influvia of several odorous bodies, through the grisly meanders of the nose whose surfaces are covered with a very sensible nerve, tis not improbable but that some contrivance for making a great quantity of air pass quick through the nose might as much promote the sense of smelling. I'm not sure this would work, but it sounds like a fun thing to try. And that was Philosophical Transactions for Monday, April 3rd, 1665. Tune in next month for a report on the properties of Maydew, the dangers of subterraneous damp, and a report on how to kill rattlesnakes.